Hi guys, it's your science teacher here, back with a, another video. This time I'm going to go through the whole of homeostasis in action. This is only a triple science topic, so if you're doing combined science, this one is sadly not for you guys. Um, but let's get straight going with this topic and let's get into it. This topic starts off by looking at how we control the temperature inside our body. And the control of temperature actually starts in the brain, uh, where the receptors um, in the hypothalamus can see a change in temperature in the blood. And also receptors in the skin also uh, can give further information to the temperature. Now, once we have detected a change, what the body needs to do is issue a response. And there are a few different responses you can have. If you are feeling cold, you might shiver. And the act of shivering and your muscles contracting, uh, they that will actually heat you up and you can have vasoconstriction. And what vasoconstriction does is it pulls the blood away from the surface of the skin. The arteries actually uh, become thinner and therefore blood is further away from the surface and you lose less heat as a consequence. And uh, because of this, you will then start to heat up. Now, if you are cold for too long, you can actually um, have severe problems from vasoconstricting for so long and you can stop getting enough blood to the places that need blood the most. And when this happens, this is called hypothermia. But what happens if you are too hot? What does your body do to respond for that? Well, if you are too hot, you will start to sweat. Um, and when the sweat evaporates off the surface of your skin, this cools your body down. And also you can get something called vasodilation. And this is where your arteries expand. This means that the blood uh, travels closer to your skin and therefore the heat can leave the surface much easier. However, if you are in the sun for too long and you stay hot for too long, this can also be bad uh, because of the fact you are sweating too much and you are losing a lot of water and this can cause a heat stroke. Also, vasodilating for too long is not good for your body. But what you want to end up is the ideal situation just down here, which is your normal artery, which is what it should look like um, if all is running smoothly. The next thing we are going to look at is how we control the amount of waste products in the body. And there are two main waste products inside our body. They are carbon dioxide, uh, which is obviously a waste product from respiration. And there is also urea. And urea is formed uh, from the breakdown of amino acids in the liver. Now, in high enough concentration, urea is in fact incredibly poisonous. However, luckily, it is filtered out by our kidneys. Now, urea can build up in your body if you eat a really high protein diet. This is because of the fact that proteins get converted into amino acids and your body can't use all of them amino acids. And in fact, uh, the amino acids can become uh, ammonia, which is a toxic gas. Uh, so your body really does uh, need to get rid of these amino acids and it does in the form of urea. And urea forms the waste product urine, which uh, builds up in the bladder and is excreted through from your body. The story of carbon dioxide is a little bit more simple. Carbon dioxide is obviously a product of respiration and we get rid of it from our body by breathing. Carbon dioxide actually travels around the body in our blood plasma, not on our red blood cells, and we excrete it out when we breathe. 
Now, we've learned that the kidneys are obviously incredibly important because they remove that harmful urea from the blood, but how do they actually work? Well, the blood travels in to the kidney via the renal artery. And then what happens is inside the kidney, your blood is filtered. And what happens during this filtration stage is um, that the blood is too large, um, in fact, to be absorbed. However, glucose, um, urea, any amino acids, they are all absorbed into the kidney. And what happens then is selective reabsorption happens. This basically means that depending on the amount of um, amino acids required, um, then it will take back um, some of uh, what it needs. It will actually take back all the glucose uh, because your body always finds a use for glucose. And inside your kidney, it's perfectly adapted for this um, absorption by having incredibly thin walled capillaries so that substances can move uh, in and out of the blood uh, really easily by active transport and diffusion. Now, after your uh, blood has been successfully filtered, the urea has been taken away and you've taken back all the minerals that you want uh, in your body, um, then what happens is it travels back into your bloodstream through the renal vein. And the kidney will send all of that waste that you don't want, all the minerals that maybe you've got too much of in your blood and all of that urea, that gets taken away. Now, there is something else that gets controlled by the kidney and that is the amount of water that gets reabsorbed. So blood goes into your kidney and your kidney will see what concentration um, of um, your blood is water and it will uh, and a hormone will be produced in the brain which will tell you uh, whether to absorb more water and get um, reabsorb more water back into the bloodstream so that you have enough or it will tell you to get rid of that water and uh, basically excrete it and that hormone is ADH and if you have more ADH uh, then you will wee more and you will have um, not highly concentrated urine it will be more of a clear colour and if you have less ADH then you will have concentrated urine and it will contain less water and this is all a hormone that comes from your brain in fact when you drink alcohol it tells your body to produce more ADH and this is why you can actually become quite dehydrated from drinking alcohol because it causes you to wee more now, all the blood in your body will pass through your kidneys around 40 times a day. That just shows you how hard your kidneys in your body work. And if you have a poor diet or maybe you do not drink enough water, this can cause your kidneys to fail. And... If your kidneys are failing, this can have massive implications. This can mean that your body stop reabsorbing all the minerals that you need and you can become incredibly fatigued and you can also fall very ill. So we need to come up with some solutions to this. And the first way of doing this is doing something called kidney dialysis. And this is where you're basically placed in a machine uh, which will filter your blood for you. So your blood travels out of your body through, um, through a syringe that is placed in your arm and it will travel through a machine which will then filter your blood. During this filtration stage, um, it contains exactly the right levels of minerals that your body needs. So it will only absorb more if your body needs it and 
that's how this works basically and then the machine will then pass it back to your body and it will then flow around your heart again and be pumped around your body. There are a few problems with kidney dialysis. For example, it's quite a long process um, and often it needs to be repeated. And whilst you are going uh, undergoing kidney dialysis, you need to make sure that you have a really controlled diet. Um, so that it doesn't affect it because when you're not on the dialysis machine um, it can have problems if your diet is not incredibly controlled. So there is another way um, of treating kidney failure and that is to replace the kidney completely using an artificial kidney and usually artificial kidneys are collected by donors. And the only real problem with this is sometimes these can be rejected by your body. Now, this is the end of this topic video. I hope you have really enjoyed it. Remember, if you did enjoy the video, please drop it a like and subscribe to the channel.